Yo best, yo best, yo best, yo best. That shit On a Monday! It's all leaving with your boy Barry Grant. I hope everybody had a great weekend. It's very hot today. You can catch me on Instagram and Twitter at All Even Podcast. You can listen to the show on SoundCloud as well as on YouTube. So like, share, and hit that subscribe button as well. We got a lot to get into. It's a packed show, a lot of NBA. NBA bubble madness continues. We're going to talk a little bit about Dane versus Paul George. Melo moves up the all-time scoring list. So we'll have a little conversation about his career as well. College football is on the brink of cancellation. A little NFL as well, highlight by Darius Geis being released by the Washington football team. Mets and Yankees have injury issues and the greatest segment on the planet, Dummy of the Week. So let's get right into it. Bubble Madness continues in the NBA. There were a lot of great games as usual, but there's two games that stuck out to me that I want to talk about. I want to talk about the Mavs versus the Bucks that happened on Saturday, and then I want to talk about the Nets and the Clippers that happened yesterday. So Bucks, Mavs, let's start with that. The game was really, really fast-paced. It was up and down. The Bucks had control of the first half. Brooke Lopez was cooking early, hit a lot of threes, but the Mavs kept it close. At halftime, it was 71-62 Bucks, and then in the third quarter, Luka kind of took it over, and they closed the gap to two points heading into the fourth. Back and forth game into the fourth quarter, the Bucks were actually up seven with like a couple minutes to go. Mavs force OT. Luka takes over the fourth and OT. And the Mavs win the game 136-132. to 132. Luka has a phenomenal triple-double. He scores 36 points, 14 rebounds, 19 assists. Finney Smith had 27 and 11. Porzingis also scores 26 points and 11 rebounds. Bucks, Brooke Lopez goes for 34. Giannis goes for 34 and 13. Chris Middleton scores 21. And like I said, man, it was a very entertaining game. But the reason why I want to bring up this game is that My friend Bishop brought up a question. He said, who's going to have the better career, Giannis or Luka? And that's a really interesting question to ask because both players are stat fillers, right? You're going to look at the stat sheet and both of them are going to have tremendous games. But how I look at it is who is going to have the biggest impact for their franchise? And my answer to that is Giannis. The Milwaukee Bucks have had some great players in their history. Luau Cinder, Oscar Robinson, Ray Allen got drafted by this team, Sam Cassell was there, Big Dog, Glenn Robinson, Sidney Moncrief. They've had a lot of great players in their history, but they haven't had much success until Giannis came, until Giannis kind of changed that dynamic and put them back on the NBA map. There has been a lot of time that has passed from those great players that have played. And it's Giannis's turn to now take this franchise to the next level. Hopefully he can get another star and do that. Nobody's going to compare Giannis to really anybody in this franchise. This will now be Giannis's team, right? You can't say the same thing about Luka. The Dallas Mavericks have had plenty of success. They won a championship nine years ago. The shadow and the allure of Dirk Nowinski still holds true, still holds very strong over this franchise. That's like, and when people listen to this, I am not comparing Dirk Nowinski to Michael Jordan. I'm just saying, if Kobe Bryant were to be drafted by the Chicago Bulls and then end up having some type of success there, the greatness and the importance of Jordan to that franchise would cast such a big shadow over Kobe Bryant's career that you really couldn't appreciate what he's done for that franchise in totality. So that's what I'm saying. I think that Luka is going to be a great player. I think he's going to be one of those stat fillers and he may average 30 points, eight rebounds and nine assists for his career. He may just do that in this new NBA. But Dirk Nowinski has had such a great impact over this franchise that I don't think that he'll ever be the guy in Dallas. Historically is what I'm saying. Giannis has a chance to be the guy historically in Milwaukee because they've they've longed for such a winner for so long. Dallas doesn't have that issue. They really don't. Dallas is a great run franchise. They have a great owner. They've had a lot of success. They've had a lot of good guys come through there. Steve Nash was there. You know, they've had a lot of good players. So I just don't feel that Luka is going to have the same franchise impact that Giannis is going to have on the Bucks. 
So when when I when I think about who's going to be better, I I have to go Giannis just because you got to put everything in that conversation. Everything, the totality of what they bring, their importance, not just the numbers, but their impact on the franchise as well. The impact on how relevant you make this team to the NBA landscape, popularity, things like that. And you're already seeing that the Bucks the the Bucks are that. Giannis has made the Bucks that. He's, he's made that team a destination. All right, turning our attention to the Nets and Clippers. Nets win the game 129-120. to 120. The Nets were in control big in this game early. They were up 21 points at the end of the first quarter, 45-24. to 24. Karis LeVert led the charge. Joe Harris as well, hitting a lot of threes early. Clippers come back in the game in the second half. Kawhi Leonard had a great game. He had 39 points. There was no Paul George, so it was only Kawhi and Sweet Lou to to hold it down. Karras finishes the game with 27 points. Joe Harris puts in 25, and Tyler Johnson puts in 21. This was a great game for the Nets. They hit 23s. They shot 55% from the field. The Clippers did not show up defensively. It was a rough night for them on a defensive end, but listen, when the Nets are going like that, there's not much you can do. They have a lot of great shooters. They play really, really hard, and the Clippers will be fine. Montrez has finally returned to the bubble. He left July 17th to tend to some family issues, so he's back now, so they're going to have a little boost. I believe this will help their championship odds a bit. Montrez is a great hustle guy. He brings a lot of energy. He's he's a tough guy. So they have definitely missed his presence because Zubac, Zubac ain't it. And when you can have Montrez on the court closing out games, that's important for the Clippers. But I'm telling you, man, those Nets, this Nets team has showed me so much in this bubble. They are one of the toughest teams I've seen. They don't quit and they shoot it well. And Jacques Vaughn has done a really good job implementing mid-range jump shots. Joe Harris is mixing it up. He's going inside. He's shooting outside. He's showing a lot more versatility in this Jacques Vaughn offense. Tyler Johnson, we already know what that kid can do. He can fill it up. He had a great run with the Heat. So he's a great piece as well. And Karis LeVert. Karis LeVert is showing people here in the bubble that he is a lock-in third star for the Nets when they get their big boys back next season KD Kyrie you don't have to say well who who's gonna be the other guy Karras is that guy Karras can carry the load he can shoulder the load he has shown the ability to carry a team this kid is really really special the Nets have a ton of talent in regards to player development the Nets are second to none there's no team that is better than the Nets developing players from no matter where they bring them from G League, the draft, they're undrafted, whatever it is. They have a system in place that every NBA team must be jealous of. They have a really, really great thing going on. Jacques Vaughn is definitely coaching for a job, and I think anybody who's seeing this can honestly say that he's a viable option to remain the coach here. I think Mark Jackson is still in the lead in regards to head coach, as well as I think Ty Lue is a, is a dark horse, but I do think that, that Jacques Vaughn should get some consideration because he's done a great job with this team. He really has. On to some drama in the NBA between Dame, Paul George, and Pat Bev. Clippers won the game on Saturday, 122 to 117. They missed two clutch free throws that cost them the game. And Pat Bev and everybody on the sidelines was laughing and pointing and making fun of him. And Dame said after the game that he took it as a form of respect because he sent them both packing in the playoffs. But then they took it to Twitter. Then Paul George was saying that he's going to go home and... Pat Bev then responded and said Cancun on three. And then Dame said, listen, y'all like to pack up and move elsewhere. Y'all a bunch of chumps. So who won this particular spat? Of course, Dame won the spat because guess what? Paul George has no leg to stand on. Paul George is a great player. Nobody's taking that away from him. However, when he was in Indiana, he was not a guy that came up big in clutch situations they had a great team that went deep into the playoffs but they could not get over the hump they couldn't beat LeBron James that team led by Paul George went nowhere they went nowhere he has not been out of the first round since 2014 he then went to OKC and was the second fiddle to Russ and they had stinkers in the playoffs not saying that he didn't put up good numbers he put up good numbers but he did not show up when it was needed 
Then guess what? He ends up he ends up leaving OKC after signing a big deal the season prior and going to the Clippers. This guy is not somebody that you want to trust in a fight because at the drop of a hat, he'll leave you for a better situation. So what Dame is saying is completely true. It's completely accurate. In regards to Pat Bev, Pat Bev should get the award for biggest cheerleader in the NBA. If there was an award for that, he'd win it every year just like Sweet Lou wins the sixth man almost every year. He would win cheerleader of the year because that's what he is. He's one of those guys that when you're playing in the park and the game is tied 19 apiece, he hasn't scored the whole game. He hits the game-winning shot, and he's the biggest talker on the court. Like, what are you doing, bro? Like, you're not that guy. You're not even on the court in fourth quarter situations for the Clippers. You're on the bench. You're on a bench when it matters. So sit there and don't say anything. I get Paul George is your teammate, but don't try to come to his defense because he is not somebody to defend. He is a waffler. He's always been a waffler. And I'm telling you right now, if the Clippers don't end up winning a championship this year or the wheels come off the bus next year, Paul George will be asking to leave the Clippers for another situation. Why? Because Paul George is what I call a survivor. He will survive. He's going to make sure that he's okay, use you as a life raft, and survive. That's what he is. So he's not somebody that you can trust in the playoffs. Dame, Dame you can trust. Dame is an old school guy. Dame wants to be the guy in Portland. He doesn't want to leave and try to win a championship and be on a star-driven team. He wants to be the guy that drives the bus. He wants to be the guy that leads them to the promised land. And listen, Kevin Garnett did that in Minnesota. He stayed there for 12 years until he realized that it wasn't going to work. And, and that was okay. Nobody gave him any flack for that. So if that ends up happening to Dame, nobody will give him flack for leaving, but we do respect him for staying and sticking it out. If this was a different year and the Blazers were in a better position in regards to seeding, I would have loved to see that matchup, Blazers and Clippers. That would have been must-see TV right there because those two teams don't like each other. I don't particularly think that any team in the NBA likes the Clippers. I think a lot of teams want to stick it to the Clippers because they have a lot of guys act like fake tough guys. You know what Paul George reminds me of? He's one of those kids that used to get picked on in school and then he ends up joining a popular group or a gang and now he's the toughest thing on the planet. You are. We, we know who you are. We know who you are. Stop trying to be something you're not because we know that you fold like loose leaf paper when it comes to the playoffs. I want to hear the excuses out of Clipperland when Paul George fails them. I, I really want to hear it because it'll be just like everywhere else he's been. Indiana, they don't miss him. OKC, they don't miss him. And I'm sure they're not going to miss him on the Clippers as well. After the break, Melo moves up the scoring list. I'm going to tell you how I feel about that. On a Monday, it's all even. I am so stressed because I hate my job. Let me guess. You're at a dead-end job and find it hard not to press the snooze button? Well, come down to Connecticut School of Broadcasting. We have campuses in Westbury, New York, Boston, Connecticut, New Jersey, North Carolina, Georgia, and Florida. Develop your skills in broadcast media that include audio production, television, radio, and sports broadcasting. Learn from industry professionals in a small, intimate class setting for a better experience. The hands-on training is second to none. And if you're worried about what to do after graduation, the Connecticut School of Broadcasting helps you to get job placement. Take it from me. It took me seven years to get here, and it's been the best time of my life. Go to GoCSB.com or dial 1-800-887-2346 for a studio tour. And who knows, maybe you'll be the next media superstar. Welcome back, y'all. So I've always heard ex-players say, leave the game better than you got it. Leave a lasting impact. Make sure you touch as many people as you possibly can in your time doing what you're doing. Carmelo Anthony just moved to 15th on the all-time scoring list, passing Paul Pierce. Historical achievement. Great achievement for Melo. 36 years old. He's still playing well. He's a role player now. But I bring that up to say, what is Melo's lasting impact on the NBA? What mark has he left? I have mixed emotions about Carmelo Anthony. He's going to go down as one of the greatest scorers in NBA history. There's no doubt about that. But can we really say that he's had a career that we thought he was going to have? 
Melo coming out of Syracuse, you saw that guy put a team on his back and lead them to a national championship as a freshman, a true freshman. For those that didn't know anything about Dwayne Wade coming out of college, Carmelo Anthony was the guy. He was the guy. LeBron coming out of high school as the chosen one, Carmelo Anthony's right behind him. Those were the two guys that you can say are going to be generational. They're going to lead the NBA into a new generation of great young players. And these are the two guys that are going to spearhead that that generation. Did it end up happening that way? Not so much. Dwayne Wade ended up being that guy. LeBron James was always going to be that guy. But Carmelo kind of faded off into the, into the shadows. Why? Why is that? In my opinion, it was will to win. When you looked at a guy like Dwayne Wade... Dwayne Wade threw his body around and he made sure that he left everything on the court. LeBron James was Mr. Do-It-All. He's the face of your NBA. He's your model citizen. He's on every advertisement, whatever it is. LeBron James, the chosen one. Carmelo Anthony got lost in the shuffle. He was a great dynamic scorer in, in Denver. But something about Carmelo Anthony was missing. There was not that killer instinct that you saw from Dwayne Wade or even those winning intangibles that you saw from LeBron. LeBron wasn't a killer early. He had to learn how to do that. But Carmelo Anthony had the skill. He had the talent. He had the skill set. But there was this lack of caring about winning. If the Nuggets got blown out, Melo was more concerned about getting 30 than getting blown out by 30. As LeBron James and Dwayne Wade were changing the landscape of the Eastern Conference, Dwayne Wade ending up winning a title in 2006 with the help of Shaq and Pat Riley, LeBron James getting to the finals the year after, going against the Spurs and getting swept, Carmelo Anthony again gets lost in the shuffle. Great scorer, Nuggets are winning games, but he's having issues with George Carl. Him and George Carl are not seeing eye to eye, and there's a lot of things, a lot of rumbling starting to go on in Denver. Is Melo happy here? Does he care about winning here? LeBron James and Dwayne Wade then decide that it's time for them to take control of their careers. They sign three-year extensions with their teams, with their respected teams. Melo, on the other hand, doesn't listen to that. He takes the additional year from Denver. So when it was time for LeBron James and Dwayne Wade to be free agents in 2010 and team up in Miami, the plan was... Wade, LeBron, and Melo. It was not supposed to be Wade, LeBron, and Bosh. He was supposed to do the same thing that those two did and end up in Miami. But because he wasn't willing to sacrifice the money, he ended up staying in Denver. So he wasn't willing to sacrifice to win. Winning was not on the forefront for Carmelo Anthony at that time. Then he forces his way to New York and demands that the Knicks trade for him rather than him sign with the Knicks in free agency. So they had to blow up the team. They had to trade everybody, including the ball boy, to go get Carmelo Anthony. Now, granted, it was a great time in New York. Everybody loved Melo here. They had a little bit of success in 2012-13 season. They won 54 games. They were a great team in the East, and things ended up not ending well in New York. Him and Phil Jackson fell out. But there was always this underbelly of uncertainty that was here. Is Melo truly invested in winning? And it's pretty comical that he passes Paul Pierce on the list because that's where I kind of have Carmelo Anthony historically behind Paul Pierce. And all because Paul Pierce had this obsession with winning. He was a passionate player. You can ask anybody that's a Boston Celtics fan. They will always say that Paul Pierce left it out on the floor. You can't really say that about Carmelo Anthony. He's always had this stigma of not leaving it all on the floor. And that's why it complicates his legacy for me because he's not a winning player in my eyes. Great talent, but he didn't end up being what I thought he was going to be. I thought that he was going to be a transcendent player to revolutionize the NBA he wasn't he was just another guy that was a great scorer that has done it over a consistent amount of time that had great individual success won a couple of gold medals in the Olympics but there was no team in the NBA that you can actually say that Carmelo 
looked like he was truly invested into winning and doing everything possible to help that franchise win. Dwayne Wade left it all in Miami. LeBron James left it all in Cleveland. MJ left it all in Chicago. Kobe Bryant gave his heart and soul to the Lakers. You can't really say that about Carmelo Anthony. Even a guy that he idolized that he played with for a little bit. Allen Iverson gave his entire body to the city of Philadelphia. To the point where he was broken down at the end of his career. So his impact, you can honestly say it's it's generational. For the younger fans, they love Melo. They think that he's a great player and, and all of that. But for the older fans, for the older generation of basketball players and basketball fans, we're a little skeptical on what what place he has. Great score, but nothing more. Scoring abilities greater than Larry Bird, but impact on the game and your team like Tracy McGrady. A lot of what-ifs with Carmelo. I personally hope that he can change my opinion in these last few years that he has in the NBA. But I doubt it. I doubt it. All right, coming up after the break, will we have college football? Yes or no? On a Monday. It's all leaving. Yo, yo, what up? It's your boy DJ G Money representing that Flip the Script podcast. But listen, right now I'm listening. I'm tuned in. I'm tapped in to a brand new podcast called the All Even Podcast with my man Barry Grant. Yo, B, what's up, man? Congrats on the new podcast. I'm listening right now. I'm tuned in. Fire, fire, all even. We here. Let's go. Welcome back, y'all. The NCAA is in trouble. They're in flux. College football is in flux. We have no idea what's going on with college football. The MAC conference has already said that they're canceling all of their fall sports. And now these power conferences are kind of just waiting in the wings because they have a feeling that they're going to cancel as well, which leaves college football in jeopardy. However, Trevor Lawrence and a couple of other players have come out and said that they want to play. Trevor Lawrence wants a players union to be formed in college sports. They want to play. They're very excited to play. They are saying that they are going to be safer being on campus rather than being out in the public willy-nilly not playing. A lot of other players are saying that they use sports, they use their football as an escape to get out of a bad neighborhood, get out of a bad situation. College is a sanctuary for them. Being home with everybody else in a bad neighborhood can only lead to bad things. They are frustrated. They're scared. They're worried. They're concerned about their future. They're concerned about their health. They want to go to school. They want to play football. So what is the remedy to this? Can college football survive? Can college football come up with a plan that makes sense for these players to be safe as well as provide college football to the masses? I'm going to say no. I don't see how that's possible unless you're going to create a bubble situation. I'm a big advocate for bubble sports. If you cannot do that, Especially in football, where there's so many staffers, so many players, there's a lot of moving parts. It just doesn't really make sense. If you can create a situation where these players can be in one isolated place, have remote learning, and then they have this dorm situation where they're just there to stay, get tested every day, go to practice, and possibly have games. That's a possibility, but a very minute possibility because the NCAA is not smart enough to come up with a plan like that. They are stubborn, they are mostly behind the times, and they're always behind the eight ball in regards to major issues. This is the NC2A. That's what they do. So I I don't trust them to be able to come up with a smart plan. I really don't. But these schools have enough resources where they can be able to protect these players. I believe that they can do that. I believe that they can create a dorm campus situation only for the players where they're not leaving they're just there but it's really up to the NCAA to figure it out and if the NFL has problems with doing this the NCAA is going to have double the problems so if I put a percentage on what the chances are that college football plays this season I'm putting it at 25 percent 25 percent colleges can't even handle an STD breakout much less COVID So it really doesn't look good, honestly. In NFL news, the Washington football team just can't get out of the news, can they? They just can't get out of the news. Darius Geis has been released from the team after having three domestic 
violence issues since the year started. Two incidents where he shoved her down and one where he strangled her. So it took three of these particular cases for you as a football team to say we've had enough. After he's come out and honestly said that he strangled her to the point where she lost consciousness. Great. This is how you handle your football team. You have animals like this on your team. It took this long for you to cut him. This team is a disaster. It never fails, man. Every week I have something bad to say about this organization. They are useless. They are a waste of time. Why even be in the NFL? There's nothing positive about this team. Nothing. And I hope Darius Geis realizes that his NFL career is over. Maybe it's time to go to the CFL. I don't even know if they're going to take you. But Burger King is hiring, my man. Burger King is hiring. They're always hiring. Your NFL career is finished. Ray Rice has never played another down in the NFL. So I suggest that you pack it the fuck up. And don't even worry about football no more. Worry about staying out of jail. Because if you do go to jail, somebody will beat on you just the same. And they won't be as nice. They won't be as nice. Because when you're unconscious, they may do something to you. I'm tired of these fake tough guys that like to take out their anger on women. You're not tough, bro. And now you're out of a job. Your NFL career never really took off, and we know why. Because you're a scumbag. So, we won't miss you because you didn't leave an impact on the NFL. You weren't that good. So, good riddance, Darius, guys. Damn shame. Damn shame. After the break, the Mets and Yankees have some injury concerns. On a Monday. It's all leaving. <laughs> I can't believe this is happening again. I'm sick and tired of this car. We have all been there, stuck on the road with people to see and places to go, so your radiator is busted. No problem. A to Z Auto can have you back on the road in no time. I took my car to A to Z, had a nice cold beverage, and was out of there before I knew it. 42 years of service, you can bet that not only do they take care of your car, but they take care of you. Custom work, nobody does it better. Bob is knowledgeable and can diagnose the problem in a matter of minutes. From his five-star reviews to the testimonials of customers' experiences, A to Z Auto is top-notch. Located at 1048 Hortons Lane in South Hole, New York. Ask for Bob and let him handle the rest. For a free quote, call 631-765-6849 and never get stuck in the heat again. Welcome back, y'all. So the Mets and Yankees have some injury concerns. Stanton has been put on the I.L., so where does this leave the Yankees offense? I think the Yankees offense is going to be just fine. They have Mike Talkman. They called up Clint Frazier. Clint Frazier is going to do very, very well for the Yankees. I just feel that it, it's, it's sad for Stanton. But here's the, here's the situation. Here's the reality. The Yankees never needed Stanton. They got him as overkill. They didn't need him. They got him because they wanted him, but they did not need him. You saw it last year. The Yankees' offense took off last year. They didn't have much. Judge was hurt. Stanton was hurt. But yet you had all of these guys fill in, play their roles, and the team excelled. They exceeded expectations and got to the ALCS. So what you're going to see is an offense that's going to look just like what they were supposed to look like before the Stanton trade happened. Clint Frazier is going to do well. He's a quirky character. He doesn't really fit the Yankees' mold of player because he's so out there. But I think this is what this team needs. They need somebody different. They need a wacky guy. And Clint Frazier fits the bill for that. So the Yankees are not going to have any issues. The offense is going to be fine. The bigger question is, is it time to give up on Stanton? Is it time to sell him for pennies on the dollar? I, I don't know. I don't know the answer to that. My opinion is I think they should trade him. I don't think that they need him. I think that it was never really a great fit. A-Rod was a great fit for the Yankees. It was a little touch and go at first, but he always looked good in those pinstripes. He looked like a Yankee. Stanton, to me, he just doesn't fit. He just doesn't look comfortable in pinstripes. This is just my opinion. I have a lot of friends that are Yankee fans, and I don't hear them talking about Stanton. It's all Judge. It's Glaber Torres. It's Garrett Cole, it's Clint Frazier, it's Andujar. These are the players that they rave about. They don't rave about Stanton. 
They don't care about Stanton. Yankee fans don't care about Stanton. So maybe it's time to, to start exploring trade options. I would, if I was the GM, if I was Cashman, I, I would see what he's worth. Maybe a team is willing to take a chance on him to see if a change of scenery might may help his durability issues. Who knows? Who knows? But the team that has major issues in regards to the injury front are the New York Mets. The New York Mets are a disaster when it comes to health right now. Syndergaard is out with Tommy John. Waka's on the IL with shoulder inflammation. You now have Stroman that just came out and said that he's opting out of the season. The second Met to do that in the last two weeks. Your ace, DeGrom, has a bad blister on his fingers. It can't get any worse. And for the guys that are healthy, they're not pitching well. You got Steven Matz, whose ERA is in the fives. Waka's ERA is in the sixes. Porcello's not pitching that great. We have to rely on a rookie, David Peterson, who's, who's not pitching bad. But he's a rookie. He's going to struggle. There's going to be times where he's going to get shelled. There's going to be times where he's going to look great. You need some veterans that know how to pitch, that understand the landscape. And we don't have any of that right now. The Mets starting pitching ERA is like 23rd in the league. It's terrible. It is absolutely terrible. We are top heavy. And what I mean by top heavy is that we have one pitcher. One. DeGrom. And if he gets hurt, you might as well mail in the season. It's over. So I don't know where the help is coming from. I have no idea what this team is going to do, but they, they are dying for starting pitching arms right now. It's not good. It's not good. And I don't see it getting any better. The fact that Stroman has opted out of the season puts the Mets in such a bad spot because they were waiting for him to come back. They were hoping that he was going to come back in and be the ace that he normally is. It's, it's really sad, man. It's a sad state of affairs that's going on in Queens. I don't know what they do, but they're going to have to figure it out or just kind of try to battle through the season and maybe call up some young guys and see what you can find. Maybe you can find lightning in the bottle. But it, it, there's no positives that's going on right now. There are no positives that are going on for the Mets right now. Offensively, it's not all bad, but it's not great either. What they have to do is focus on defense. They really have to tighten up that defense and make sure that they help their starting pitching as best they can. They can't make errors in the outfield. They can't make bonehead errors in the infield. They have to make sure that they play clean, solid, fundamental baseball. It may be hard to ask because we're talking about the Mets here, but ah, it's, 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 it's really depressing. Really, really depressing to watch. It's really depressing to hear any reports or news that comes out of the Mets. Anytime I see a tweet or a story from Andy Martino, I want to break my phone because I know that it's something bad. I just know. I know that it's always going to be something bad. There's nothing positive about this team this year. It really isn't. And that's just the reality. That's just the facts. On to lighter news. The greatest segment on the planet, Dummy of the Week. On a Monday. And so we're leaving. This is a public service announcement. Down in your luck? Tired of being curved? Sick of going out with the fellas and being the only loser without a lady? Well, I got something for you. It's called Sex Panther. Legend has it that it's made out of real bits of real panther, so you know it's good. To men, it stings the nostrils. But to women, you may as well be a slab of meat in a dog pound. And that's not all it does. You could be getting ready to see that special fox and disaster hits. No money in the budget for gas, only dinner for two. No problem. The fumes from Sex Panther can give your car 38 miles to the gallon. Sold you yet? I thought so. For $69.99, go from unlovable loser to the cock in the walk. Sex Panther. 60% of the time, it works every time. Welcome back, y'all. So without further ado, the greatest segment on the planet, Dummy of the Week. Dummy. We yeah. pick candidates on Monday and Friday, and then we pick the winner on that Friday show. And our first candidate, may I have the drum roll, please? And the first contestant is Draymond Green. Draymond Green is my first candidate for Dummy. Yeah. because he doesn't know how to shut his mouth. There is one thing about Draymond Green that you know that will always be consistent, and that is his mouth running. He can't stop it. His game is terrible, 
but his mouth just keeps going. His mouth is very, very consistent. Why would you go ahead and talk about another player when you're still actively playing? Why would you have any type of opinion about where this particular person should go or should play? Those are conversations you should have in the back. You know, like other players do when they're tampering. They don't do it in front of the camera, dummy. Every time you open your mouth, Golden State fans get more upset because they know it was your mouth that ran Kevin Durant out of town. They know it's your mouth that cost them Game 7 of the NBA Finals. They understand that they can't get any other players to come in here because your contract stops them from getting other good players. Maybe you saying that Devin Booker should get out of Phoenix because he deserves better, he deserves a win, is the same feeling that Golden State fans have with you. Maybe you should shut up and leave and go somewhere else and try to figure it out so they can be able to go on with their happy lives. You have caused disruption on this team for too long. You're causing disruption and you're not even playing. How does that work? You get fined and you're not even playing. So Draymond Green, I hope that your mouth knocks all the other contestants out and that you become the winner for Dummy of the Week. That's all for this show. I'll see y'all Friday. In the meantime, stay cool, stay safe. Peace. You can catch me on Twitter and Instagram at All Even Podcast. Listen to the show on SoundCloud. And check out my YouTube channel, All Even Podcast. And don't forget to share, like, and hit that subscribe button.